This video is part of a first course in modelling analysis and control and gives an introduction to Z-transforms. We've decided then that it's often convenient to consider values at distinct points in time rather than as continuous signals and we introduced time series models which are useful but these do not deal with the fact that real systems are continuous so we need another framework. Here we're going to introduce the Z-transform, which is a convenient framework for representing discrete signals and their interrelationships with real continuous systems. Sampling. We begin by considering the sampling process, which means measurement at regular periodic intervals. Now, questions we might ask are, how might a sampled signal be represented mathematically? And what information is lost in the sampling process. Here's a picture then that represents sampling. You can see what we're doing is we're only taking the values at specific points marked by these arrows. Now sample data therefore can be considered as a series of impulses with magnitude matching the magnitude of the underlying continuous time signals. So in other words these vertical arrows are a bit like impulses. We know from our Laplace transforms that the Laplace transform of a single impulse at time k capital T is given as e to the minus s k t. So what are we going to get if we have lots and lots of impulses like we have here? Well clearly we're just going to end up with this infinite sum. So the Laplace transform, and I've called it y star of s to indicate that it's a sampled signal, so the Laplace transform of the sampled signal is the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of y of k t e to the minus s k t. For convenience, because we don't like using this exponential term, people tend to do this substitution. So they write z to the minus 1 is equivalent to e to the minus s t. So that infinite sequence now comes out like this. y star of s equals y of z is the sum from k equals 0 to infinity y k t z to the minus k. Now it will be obvious to you that the Laplace transform of y of t and the z transform are very different and that's because they don't contain the same information. The sample signal has no information about what has happened into sample. So we know what's happened at this point and at this point we do not know what has happened in between. Let's look at some common signals then. So having defined the Z-transform, it's important to determine what this is for signals we come up against. And as with Laplace transforms, it's useful to have a lookup table with the most common signals included. We're going to exploit this particular formula. It comes up quite a few times. So the sum to infinity of a to the power k is 1 over 1 minus a. Let's start with an exponential then. So y of t is e to the minus at. If I do my infinite sum, I end up with this term here. And then you'll see there's a power k in this term and a power k in this term. So I can combine them with brackets and I get the sum to infinity of e to the minus at z to the minus 1 all to the power k. I then use this well-known formula here and it reduces to this z transform here, 1 over 1 minus e to the minus at z to the minus 1. So a summary, if you see a signal of the form a over 1 minus alpha z to the minus 1, that is representing an exponential. The discrete pole alpha, you can see the alpha here, um, is given by e to the minus at, and it depends on a continuous pole minus a, and the sample rate t. So you can see the a was in here in the original exponential signal, but it also depends upon the sample rate capital T. What about a step? Well, a step or a constant could be considered as an exponential with a equals zero. That's just a shortcut. And you'll very quickly see that therefore the z transforms given by this. So if you see something like a over one minus z to the minus one, that's representing a step. As a by the by, when you did Laplace transforms, 1 over s might be a step or it might be a transfer function representing integral action. And you'll see the same here in discrete time, that something over 1 minus z inverse could also represent integral action. What about a pure sinusoid? Now, the easiest thing to do is represent the sinusoid as two exponentials, because we already know 
the z transform of an exponential. So without bothering with the details, you end up with this here for sine omega t. And you can go through the same process and do cosine, and what you'll see is you get the same denominator, but a slightly different numerator. So what's the conclusion? If you see a signal of this form here, a z to the minus 1 plus b over 1 minus alpha z to the minus 1, and the critical thing is here, you can see plus z to the minus 2, the coefficient, I have a coefficient of 1 there, and a coefficient of 1 there. So two coefficients of 1, and the middle coefficient this alpha has to satisfy this inequality. If it's between minus 2 and 2, then that denominator is telling you that you've got some combination of sine and cosine. What about a decaying sine, which is a very common signal here, e to the minus at sine omega t? Well, again, without going through the fine details, you can see the z transform reduces to this form here. Again, you can do cosine and you'll find it has the same denominator, but a slightly different numerator. So again, this signal is recognized by the complex poles in the denominator. So if you solve for the poles of the denominator, what you'll find is they're given by e to the minus a capital T plus or minus j omega t. You could actually see these two terms sort of being given up here originally. And they are complex gamma plus j epsilon. So if you have complex poles in the z domain, it tells you that the underlying signal is a decaying sinusoid. What's the impact then of changing the sample time? You can see here I've got the same continuous time signal, which is represented by this blue curve, but I've got very different sample rates, sample rate of 1, sample rate of 2, sample rate of 3. And you can see that the sampled signal is very different. So the information that you're taking depends upon the sample rate, and that will therefore also affect the Z transform. So let's have a look at some simple examples. We'll start with the exponential. So we know that an exponential is given by this term here, capital A over 1 minus alpha Z to the minus 1, and the pole E to the minus AT corresponds to the original exponential E to the minus AT. So what do you see? This is a convergent exponential if a is bigger than zero which will tell you that p is between naught and one so if you get a pole between naught and one a real pole between naught and one then you know that represents a convergent exponential now you'll notice the hint here positive real axis only and clearly as a increases p gets smaller so you converge faster per sample what about the exponent, uh, the, sorry, the sinusoid? What you'll notice here is that the poles have got a modulus of one. So if your poles have a modulus of one, it represents a pure sinusoid. And for a decaying sinusoid, what you notice, you see your poles are now slightly more complicated. You've got this e to the minus a capital T plus or minus j omega t. So the convergence is linked to the modulus which is this term, and the oscillation is linked to the imaginary part here, or the argument. So let's expand on this. Let's look first just at exponentials. Now you'll see I've got the s-plane, or Laplace, over on the left, and the z-plane over on the right. So if we start with, what if you have a pole? We'll do the blue one here. Okay. So in Laplace, if you had a pole there, which is something like minus 1, I'm afraid I've gone over the, the, um, the axis, then you can see that corresponds to this pole here. So I've called this one slow. It's fairly near the imaginary axis, so it's slow, but it's convergent. And where is it in the z-domain? You can see it's fairly close to the unit circle. What happens next? If I go to the left in the s-plane, then I get faster. What happens in the z-domain? You can see the corresponding pole has moved nearer to the origin. So as the pole moves nearer to the origin, I get faster. If the pole lies here on the imaginary axis in the s-plane, that's an integrator or a step, then you can see the corresponding pole lies here 
on plus one. Okay, precisely on plus one. So s equals zero maps to z equals one. And finally, if your pole was out here in the right half plane in the less in the s plane, then you'll see that that maps to a pole outside the unit circle in the z plane. And you'll notice here that exponentials map only to the positive real axis in the z plane. Now, what if we have exponentials or decaying exponents, sorry, decaying sinusoids or exploding sinusoids? So we can go through the same sort of process. If we start in the s plane with poles actually on the imaginary axis, that corresponds to pure sinusoids. And you can see where do they map in the z plane? They lie on the unit circle. So sinusoids map to the unit circle in the z-plane. And then what you'll find is if you have some more typical poles, like these ones here that have got a real part and an imaginary part, you can see they have mapped over here. These ones are fairly close to the imaginary axis in the s-plane, so they're fairly close to the unit circle in the z-plane. And then you see the green ones have got a smaller imaginary part, and they've also got uh, they're further into the left half plane, and you see, what do you see with these green ones over here? They're much closer to the origin, and also the argument is different. So if I mark the argument here, theta and phi, you can see that theta for the green ones is less than phi for the blue ones, and that corresponds to the fact that the imaginary part in the S plane is smaller. What about some other insights with oscillatory modes? Um, so consider three different values of sampling time t and consider what happens to the poles as you change the sampling time. So I'm going to start with a sampling time of 1. There we have it. And here's my poles. And you see those give me this blue cross here. So that's where the pole position is. Now what happens if I take the same signal and make the sampling time slower. So I'm sampling twice as slowly. Then what happens to the pole? You can see it's moved, it's closer to the origin, and also the argument or the angle is bigger. So I get more rotation or more phase change per sample and I decay more per sample. What happens if the sampling time goes to three? And now you see the pole has got even closer to the origin and the angle has got even bigger. So I decay even faster per sample and my phase change is even bigger per sample. So as the sampling time increases, the pole moves closer to the origin and the ratio of the imaginary to the real part gets bigger or the argument of the phase gets bigger. And here's the graphs of the underlying signal. So you can see that from a different viewpoint. So you see we've got the same signal but we're slowing the sampling time down from 1 to 2 to 3. And what you'll see is as the sampling time gets slower, the phase change between samples is much, much bigger, and also the decay rate per sample is much, much quicker. So we've achieved the same decay rate in this bottom curve with three times fewer samples. So there's a summary of what happens. So poles in the Laplace domain are mapped like this. So a pole P in the Laplace domain goes to a pole E to the PT in the Z domain. Inside the unit circle is convergent, outside is divergent. A modulus of 1 is a pure sinusoid, and complex poles imply oscillation. Now the final thing we need to cover is aliasing. If we sample too slow, we are unable to see fast oscillatory signals, as these may have several periods between each sampling instant. And this is called aliasing, and it's a risk. Ideally, we sample fast enough to capture all the important frequencies. So let's do a bit of maths first. I'm going to start with this simple sinusoid, sine omega t, give you the z transform, there it is, and calculate the pulse. There are the pulse. Now, let's have a look at what happens with two different signals and the same sample rate. So if you look over here, you can see I've got two very different signals, sine of pi over 10t and sine of 21 pi over 10t. I'm sampling them both at the same sample rate. 
I calculate the Z transforms, there they are, and also on the far right, I calculate the poles. But now I'm going to notice something. I happen to know that cos of pi over 10 equals cos of 21 pi over 10. And similarly, you could say the same for sine. So if you look at these two poles, you will find the numerical values here are actually identical. And if you look at the terms in the Z-transform, you'll find that these values, OK, sorry about the pen making a bit mess, these values are identical. So those two Z-transforms are identical. So given those Z-transforms, which signal did you have? Did you have sine pi over 10 or 21 pi over 10? And the answer is you do not know. OK, so we cannot determine the original signal from the Z-transform. Now we can look at this using some graphs. You see we've got two very different signals here. We've got this blue signal, which is a slow sinusoid. And we've got this red signal, which is a fast frequency sinusoid. And we're going to sample both at the identical sample rate, which you can see using all these black arrows. Now the key thing is, if you look at all these black arrows, and that's mapped down on this bottom curve here, you can see they are identical. So once you have sampled those signals, and all you can see is what's in this bottom figure, you cannot tell the difference between the two. You don't know which signal you had originally. Now aliasing is the term used to describe the phenomena of a fast oscillating signal, the red curve here, appearing due to sampling to be oscillating at a much slower frequency. If you saw this curve at the bottom, you would infer that you had the slow frequency. You would not naturally infer you had that red curve. Now, why does this happen? It happens because we have this well-known identity that sinusoids are periodic. So sine theta is the same as sine 2n pi plus theta. Or if you look at this in terms of frequencies, if you have a frequency sine omega plus 2n pi over capital T times time, then you find that irrespective of where you put n, as long as n is an integer, the sample signal will be the same. So a large number of frequencies, here they are, all you have to do is change n, all appear the same after sampling. So some general advice, which you will see in the books. Okay, If you want to avoid aliasing, you must first and foremost satisfy this identity here. So you must sample fast enough so that aliasing cannot occur. But in general, people would recommend that you go about 10 times faster than the, um, should we say, the limit of the sampling frequency. So you sample about 10 times faster than necessary to avoid aliasing. Some conclusions then. We've introduced the Z-transform as a systematic means of modelling sampled signals and related them to Laplace transforms. We've shown the links between the pole positions of the Laplace for a continuous signal and the Z-transform for the sample signal. You should have a table of Z-transform to hand so that you can quickly interpret the underlying signals from the poles of those Z-transforms. Now we've also emphasised the concept of aliasing. When you sample, information is lost. And the slower you sample, the more information you lose. And this is particularly important to oscillatory signals, which must be sampled fast enough to ensure you capture the signal adequately.